Okay. Great roll. Okay, we're going to get started. Again, I'm Jimmy Klein. I'm the director of enforcement. And in this presentation, you will hear from a panel of industry experts about the management and maintenance of facilities and assets through the lens of change management. These industry professionals will discuss successful use of technologies, controls, and other best practices. So I'll introduce the panel. We have Katie Klebo, mitigation engineer at WEC, Christian Henderson, manager of substation operation and engineering at San Diego Gas and Electric, Stephanie Little, manager of regulatory compliance at Arizona Public Service, and Lennon Moran, EMS manager systems security and compliance at Sacramento Municipal Utility District. All right, it's all yours, Kevin. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I just wanna say welcome and it is so wonderful to meet everyone and get a chance to interact in person. And it turns out people are much more excited to talk to you when you're not asking them questions about their PNCs. Uh, so that's really wonderful. Uh, and I'm sure you're excited to not talk about PNCs with us as well. Um, so today's topic, uh, when we started going through what to have this panel on, we met with some of WEC's senior technical advisors who have a lot of experience in the industry to ask what are some points that everyone would like to hear about. And what we came up with was change management. All right, change management within the standards is an interesting topic because there are a bunch of standards where change management is really an implicit requirement, right? In order to have effective compliance with PRC5 or FAC8, you need to have a successful change management program. So we reached out within WEC to see what entities had successful change management programs. So you can see here our panelists were all from entities who were nominated sometimes multiple times um, from personnel within WEC for having very successful change management programs. So today you're going to hear from each of these entities starting at a big picture level, hearing about their culture and their mindset that leads to change management success. We're then gonna go down the level to hear what are they doing to build and establish that culture and then finally, we'll wrap it up with what are they actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What tools, processes, technology, what are they doing that is allowing them to have so much success in change management? And you'll hear there's a lot of similarities between our panelists. There's a lot of different ways to be successful with change management. Right? There is no one size fits all. It's going to vary greatly based on the size of your company, the resources available, the number of assets that you are tracking. So I will go ahead and let the panelists introduce themselves. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and talk through how your change management program is structured. So we'll go ahead and kick it off with Christian, please. Test, test, can you guys hear me? All right, first off, welcome to San Diego. Not sure if you got that announcement already. Um, Welcome for the warm weather we're having, Santa Ana winds, which for some is great, for others like myself, not so great, with another fire that could potentially start from them. Um, I, like she said, my name is Chris Anderson. I've been with Santa Gas and Electric about 15 years now. And my group is in the substation operation engineering team, which really compiles of compliance activities, focus with substations and our transmission system, as well as uh, putting new inf inf infrastructure in place. So we have a lot of engineers in my team and also electric control technicians who deal with a lot of remote terminal units. So wide range of individuals, but from a company standpoint, we are we have roughly 4,800 megawatts of peak load, generation capacity about 3,100 3, megawatts. 
And from a service in C, we basically, like most people here, registered function, distribution provider, generator owner, generator operator, resource planner, transmission owner, transmission operator, transmission planner, and transmission service provider, like most probably in this room. Um, one thing that's always key for us when it comes to change management is really the SME base. So we have roughly 4,700 employees ranging from the gas side to electric side, project managers, management leaders across the board. But we're really huge on getting SME based. So we're looking for people to own the change, own the topic, get some insight as far as what are we doing and why. It really helps us leveraging a culture of that ownership, but also that accountability. And that's really helped us in the starting front to get really a good foundation and then a leadership supports as well. But the big thing for us is that SME base where we get that insight, that visibility, and it helps us to ensure we're not pushing a new change, a new process without the people who are doing it day in and day out to have impact. So that's kind of what we do from a chance manager structure to start. Is it back on now? <laughs> I turned it off and back on. Um, thanks, Christian. Um, so good afternoon. I was going to say good morning. I've already lost the day, but good afternoon. Uh, Stephanie Little with Arizona Public Service. I am uh, the manager of the NERC Regulatory Compliance Group, which is the oversight group at APS. Um, where we have a number of advisors and consultants that help us um, make sure APS stays compliant. You just saw one of them, Jessica Lopez, was up here previously. Um, at APS, we have uh, about 6,300 um, owned uh, in generation. We serve about 1.3 million customers. We have over 6,000 miles of transmission. Um, and we are about every registered entity function except for an RC. So um, pretty much every standard and requirement is applicable to us. So it's, it's a big load. Um, having said that, similar to Christian, our um, strategy or model, if you will, is reliant on our activity owners in the field and across our business areas, those subject matter experts who perform the compliance activities themselves. We work with them um, to make sure that they uh, own those requirements, understand those requirements, and are comfortable with those requirements, and therefore can accomplish change management in a very successful way. Um, and as Christian stated, if there are changes to programs, processes, or standards, we collaborate with them through all of that to make sure that we hear their voice as the ones who have to perform those activities and make sure that the processes work not only for compliance, but also for them. So that's kind of how we're structured at APS, and um, that's it. I'm excited to be here with you today. Lennon. Hello, hello. Yeah, hey, good afternoon, and um, we are sorry that we are holding you back from the network reception, but if you can just hold on for a few more minutes, maybe you can take something back to your organization or maybe even feel better about what you're doing because after hearing from us, oh, this sucks, right? So hopefully not. Uh, my name is Lennon Maran. I'm the EMS Manager for System Security and Compliance. Um, at SMART, you know, we are a TO, TOP, just like the GP, uh, GO, GOP, DP, ESP, uh, RP, and um, we have about 640,000 customers over a 900 square mile area and about 1.5 population, 1.5 million population, right? And then uh, we have about 200 employees. So at SMART, um, or glossary of terms in SMART, change management is defined as the administration of a set of processes to introduce changes into the production environment in a controlled fashion, which minimizes disruption and uh, you know increases efficiency. And our processes, our procedures are intended to ensure that all changes are reviewed, approved, assessed, prioritized, and documented, you know, for future references. Obviously, just like any other organization, we have so many different business units, and so each of them have their own business processes and change management processes which works very well for them. However, the key difference is that we have this overlapping circles of influence so that all the different stakeholders are appropriately informed. And the keys, you know, the drivers behind our change management process are obviously safety, security, reliability, compliance, and efficiency. And for the purpose of this discussion, we are going to, I'll mostly focus on the BES 
facility change management. Thank you so much. It was always very interesting to kind of hear how the different entities did this. We didn't really know ahead of time how everyone was structured and what they were doing. And we just knew this was success. So it's interesting to see how similar the structures are between the different entities. All right, next, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the big picture. So what has made your company successful in change management? And we'll go ahead and start that with Stephanie. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, so kind of like I stated, um, to us, it's important to make sure that uh, regardless of what the change management is for, whether it's for a specific standard like a PRC-5 or a FAC-8 or a SIP-10, or if it's just change management in a more general stance, it's important that our processes outline what that is and that all of our business areas are comfortable um, with those processes. So we focus in, we have something we call our APS core, and it focuses on our people. Um, and kind of the four pillars of that, if you will, are accountability, auditability, traceability, and sustainability. And to us, it's important to hit every one of those. We have to make sure that individuals um, own their requirements and understand what that means, um, that they are documenting and processing appropriately, um, you know, that we have some transparency throughout the company um, and also when we get into our audits to say this is what we do and how we do it. Um, and then we have to have programs that are sustainable. If we only can perform it once, it's not going to be a successful program. So we have to find ways to engage our business areas and figure out how do we make this last for the long term. Where we can, we try to implement change management from an enterprise level. Um, we've been able to do that from a SIP 10 perspective where regardless of the business area, they use one tool and they perform change management on assets the same, um, no matter where they work. Um, other areas, like with PRC5, it makes a little more sense for uh, some larger business areas to kind of have a little bit more unique change management programs. So T&D may look similar to generation, but there might be some slight variations just based on what works well operationally. So it's important that they understand that and that we work with them. While we are the oversight um, area of APS, we want to make sure our business areas know that we're a partner to them. We are not their specific auditor, right? We are their business partner to help them make sure they can perform their jobs successfully. So that's, you know, kind of how we look at it. We also have um, a tone from the top. Uh, we have a committee of executives um, across our company that have any type of NERC compliance under their organization that meet a minimum of five times a year to get together and talk about NERC compliance. Um, how we're performing, do we need you know, improvements, are there gaps, what our successes are, um, and we have everybody across the APS executive suite in that room um, who is supporting our goals and our compliance, and then it feeds down from them. So I think that's really important, has really, really helped with our success. So I would say if you don't have it, get your exec executives involved, um, get their buy-in, and it will help you, um, you know, when it gets out into the level of the compliance activity personnel. Thank you so much. And let's go ahead and hear from Christian next. So similar to Stephanie and the same aspects as far as some process and procedures, but one thing I think we've done a, a good job over the past five to six years, and it's been kind of forced based off of what's going on in the service territory, uh, from wildfire starting to uh, Aliso uh, Nigel's for the gas leak. Um, to different functions and aspects that's forcing us to shift the way we're doing things, to increase renewables, where we've taken a view from not just a compliance view, but globally. So our culture has been successful really because there's been a lot more training on change management across the board. So a lot of leaders have been forced to take training sessions to teach them how to conduct a change management process. What does that look like? What does that mean? And it's not a one-day course. It's four to five days of here's a project you have, an issue you have in your group, how do you perform that successfully? Who comes on the bus with you? 
Who's the people that are on board? What is that process? How do you have stakeholders? How do you have champions? What does it mean to have a champion? So we took that global spot, spotlight, what helped us also transition to, in the compliance arena, a very similar process and procedures in place. So we're holding people accountable, but we're realizing how do we make sure at the end of the day, this is successful and not a box that we're checking. Um, the other thing that we've done a pretty good job of is we have a group of individuals that are called organizational development advisors. So strictly job is to help with change management issues in that avenue. So we reach out to them for guidance assistance. How do we conduct ourselves in this matter? What do you recommend as far as new opportunities? So it's it's similar to Steffi on the lower level, but also the global. Like you mentioned, leadership is huge and even executives have to buy in. So when this program was pushed out to, to us, it changed our company's culture from a growth mindset where we're thinking of what's next, what's future, but also the ability to make the change yourself if you feel it's a great project and move forward with it. Um, then the last thing I'll say too is we've had a new term called a tiger team, which is just a creative way of saying you've been told to be on the special project and do everything else you're supposed to do in your day. But it really gives different spotlight to different procedures, projects, but also visibility to senior leadership. So a couple of three methods we kind of use to get more of a global culture aspect, including to the um, compliance things like Stefan alluded to. Yeah, I'm going to echo what you know Christian and Stephanie mentioned, right? Um, but we're still evolving. We're trying to constantly improve. So that's one thing which you have to keep in mind. And what one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, buying from the leadership, right? Senior leadership, executive teams, that goes a long way. Because not only does it show that all is smart, that is very important to the leadership, but also when you want resources, whether it's, you know, new tools or some business process changes or even time for training. If you have the leadership bind, it's easier to get in, right? And uh, the other thing which we've done is, I think um, Christian mentioned about champions. We have change management champions in each business unit. Their job is to make sure that processes and procedures for change management are developed, implemented, followed, and reviewed on a periodic basis to make sure that we continue to improve on that, right? And then, um, most companies will have processes, things they do on a formal basis, on a day-to-day -day things, which are managing changes. But if you codify them, then what it does is it brings in some consistency to your processes. It brings in uh, the same things which you can repeat again and again. And of course, tribal knowledge is not lost. So what the Jason Kelsey's and the Taylor Swift's are doing today, that can be repeated by somebody else with the added advantage that you know uh, it can be easily verified and audited by the TMZs and the New York Post. Right? And so um, that's what we are um, trying to do in terms of getting automation tools. We do a lot of automation in terms of getting tools, maybe business process changes. And then we also have the steering committee meetings and the change advisory board meetings, which helps us uh, manage changes better. And then um, Finally, you know, technology is just one aspect. We have to make sure the people who are using the technology are trained properly. And so we spend a lot of time in training people with the tools which we're gonna use. Thank you so much. I realized I threw everyone off their groove by calling in the wrong order. So we'll go back to the right order this time. Sorry, guys. All right, so now we've talked about the big picture. So let's go down to how do you actually make this happen? So it's easy to say we have a culture of this, but what are you doing on a daily, monthly, weekly basis to develop this culture? And we'll go ahead and start with Stephanie on purpose this time. Thanks, I was actually ready for this one. <laughs> It's okay, we, we work our way through, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think this doesn't happen overnight. Um, to have a successful change management culture takes some time and a lot of effort. Um, and we've been working on that for a number of years at APS and we continue to work on it every day. And I think some of the important things we do day to day are um, focus on how do we you know, have a continuous improvement mindset, a growth mindset, and how do we continue to move forward and mature our programs? Because that's kind of what it's about. And you can't do everything at one time. 
you can't make everything awesome overnight, right? So you have to kind of just chunk away at it. Um, some of the things we do whenever we have a big change coming from, from NERC, you know, maybe a, a new standard or a change to a standards coming, kind of like a couple that are headed our way uh, January 1st of 2024. We have a really robust um, process for standard implementation that we engage our business areas with and say, this is what's coming. What is it going to take to get us there? and keep us there. Um, and I think that helps us to be successful. Um, if we get it right when we roll it out, it's you know gonna have better chances of staying successful. So we focus a lot on that and kind of the initial implementation and how do we get there in a good state, not just barely crossing the line. So that's important for us. Um, we have a lot of processes and procedures as I'm sure everybody does, right? Um, included in those processes for us is a very um, easy way for our business areas to facilitate discussions with us should they need them. Um, if they see something that they don't understand or that maybe has gone wrong, they can quickly act on that, get with you know the NERC regulatory team, and we can help them through that. Um, either to course correct or if it turns into being a reportable incident or such, then we can help with corrective actions on the back end. So the ability for them to talk to us, the more they reach out to us, we feel the more successful we are. It's important that they can do that and they do. So that's one thing we continue to do um, all the time is let our business areas know we're here for them and they do reach out to us. Um, we use a lot of tools and, and have a lot of internal controls. We use tools such as, I mean, as simple as Excel, which, you know, is always sounds outdated, but it still can be very powerful in the right settings. Um, we use Power Base, we use Maximo, and we use SignaFlow. And across those tools, we're able to develop workflows, reminders, peer checks, reviews, all of the key factors to really have successful programs um, to help our business units um, get as automated as they can get, right? If we can remove the manual need for them to perform activities, it helps them not only with workload, but it also takes some of the stress off their plate, if you will. So that's kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we focus on education, knowledge, partnership, and you know, internal controls is a big push for us to make things a little smoother. Thank you so much. Next, Lennon. Yeah, I think as I mentioned before, right, at SMART, each department have their own different change management processes which require, uh, works for them. However, there are hooks into these which help us inform the other stakeholders in a timely manner, right? Um, since we're here at the RNS workshop, I'm gonna focus more on the BES facility change management. At SMART, we have what is called as the bulk electric system at least to operation checklist program. We lovingly call this as a rock. Uh, this is an overarching set of processes that help manage uh, changes to BES facilities, right? The, the project manager assigned to each of these facility changes are responsible for managing the changes. This is, this contains multiple um, you know checklists multiple handoffs to other processes so for example there may be handoffs to telemetry process there may be handoffs to you know um, facility rating processes the handoffs to ems change management processes so it's built into the project schedule so there are sign offs and checks off checks and balances one year six months three months they off, and these are all signed and approved by various, you know, leaders within the organizations of the different business units. So not only are they informed, but they're also approving these changes. So nobody can come back and say, hey, I was not informed, I didn't approve these changes, and so on and so forth. And then when we do these handoffs, there are inbuilt processes which do other things, which may be compliance with uh, ERC standards, compliance with FACT standards, compliance with SIP standards, and so on and so forth. And this is how, um, as an example, as the EMS manager, I'm responsible for the EMS change management process, but my delegates and SMEs and the day-to-day -day operations are how to handle these changes and work with other stakeholders to make sure that everybody's on the same page. 
Thank you so much, Lennon. So, same sentiment as Lennon and Stephanie, something we have at SCG. Um, one thing we do as well is uh, on a weekly level, especially if there's a change mentor we're implementing, is kind of have a stand up meeting where it's a 15 minute stand up. It's a quick meeting, talk about obstacles, issues, problems. And then the goal is to identify what are the big variables, challenges you're having this week, and to make sure we can at least put attention to them, prioritize, adjust. Hey, this is what we got to focus on for this specific standard, or we can move on to the next item. Um, the other thing, too, is you heard from them is accountability is huge for any change management successful aspect. So once it's implemented, it's always okay, now what's next? So we do a pretty good job, I think, internally of having certain communication that goes out and it's a visibility we have at a larger audience for that accountability. So there's supervisors, there's leaders, all in that email chain is here's the maintenance triggers, we'll call them, but maintenance items that are coming up to be due it's for vis so vis visibility so everybody can see here's what's coming up and here's the st status we have. So we can have accountability from a leadership standpoint to say, hey, have we updated this? Has that been implemented? But it's really that exposure portion of it. And then one thing that Stephanie alluded to is, um, it's, it's funny, Excel has been around 20, 30 years, and it's still a go-to for a lot of situations, a lot of tracking. There's technology out there, smart sheets is one good one as well. Um, you know, OneDrive is another aspect, but it's it's way, how do you communicate an item that everybody has the same visibility at the same time of the data, and you know it's the most up-to-date copy of that information. And that's from a change management, how we evolved, where it's not a, which version is this, which section is this, it's, here's the link, we all have the same access to that link, so you know when you're opening it, that's the most update. So that's not a latency in that time scale. So I think some of those technology items, I mean, I think we all could admit when COVID occurred, we all were forced to go more technology and have less face-to-face -face meetings. I think it also opened up more doors to, from a team standpoint, to action items, to status update tasks. Um, I think all our emails probably increased dramatically over the past couple of years, um, but some for the best, you know, some because there is more accountability and more process in place improvement. So. For us, some of the change really on a day to day is really in that space from a accountability, visibility, most importantly, use technology that's available and trying new technology and seeing if it works and if there's issues, adjust associated with it. All right, thank you so much. It sounds like communication is kind of a theme of today, right? Making sure that open communication is key to not just internal compliance, but compliance and improving compliance to auditors. So that's kind of one of our themes. All right, and then last question. So this is sort of the lowest level. Like, what are you doing on a tools, processes, training, education? Like, what are you doing to actually implement your change management program? So what tips and tricks could people take away and start implementing now as they work on developing their culture? Um, what could they do to boost their change management program now. And we'll go ahead, Lennon, kick us off. So uh, let me focus on the EMS change management process, right? And uh, it's tied to SIP 10 and in some ways to POP 3 and IOWA 10 because of our involvement with the California ISO network model submission for our RC West and EIM. And hopefully um, it answers the question. If not, um, we'll see what happens. So within the Transmission Planning and Operations Department, which is where EMS lies, we have what is called the standard practices. These are a set of processes to complete tasks in a timely manner, in a controlled manner, which are documented for everyone, right? And we have what is called as SP618E, which is the EMS change management process, which describes how to manage changes within the EMS. So we assess risks for each of this change and categorize them, high, medium, and low. They are obviously not connected to SIP002, but more from the operational and reliability risk. And then there are examples, and definitions of what these high, medium, low impact changes are. And there are processes for each of these high, medium, low, the templates for how to manage changes. So it's easy for our staff to look, look at the change, review the change, and make sure that uh, they follow the appropriate process. And I think I mentioned before, we have change management champions, and one of the jobs is to ensure that all these changes are managed properly, and they review it annually at least, but more often if needed, based on lessons learned on the change management implementation. So, uh, 
what we do in terms of notification is to use a tool called ITOA. Right? There are workflows built into it. Depending upon the change, appropriate people are notified, appro uh, approvals taken uh, from different individuals if needed. So for all that changes, the EMS manager needs to approve it. For high and medium changes, the EMS manager and the power system operations managers uh, both approve this change. The medium and high impact changes so require um, a backup plan. And then there are timelines, right? For low impact changes, you have to have a minimum of 24 hours notification. For medium, is 48 hours. And for high impact, it's 10 business days. We also conduct um, structured regression testing for high impact changes, which have formalized test plans, which people sign off after finishing. And then we invite our power system operators to come in and conduct unstructured testing on our QA system. So talking about the QA system, um, we do have identical sets of hardware, software, almost identical baselines with some differences for both our QA and development system. And then we also have RTU simulators. We have data broadcasters. So this allows us to have an environment where we can effectively test operationally and from a security control point of view for SIP10, you know, all of the changes required. And as I mentioned, within this change management process, there are certain templates which allows us to go into SIP impact changes, right? So, for example, if we have baseline changes, then we use another tool called Sigma Flow, which triggers additional workflows to manage uh, changes from SIP baselines to addition of new net, uh, assets, addition of cyber assets, addition of BCSs, making sure all the security control testing is done. And all of these are signed off because of the way we set up Sigma flow that there are checks and balances and somebody has to review all of the changes. And then of course, then we have the SIP the cybersecurity, which has an oversight to ensure that the changes which the EMS team has performed, they can go and review and make sure that they can do periodic checks to ensure uh, the execution of those processes are followed. The cybersecurity team also has various uh, dashboards within their to ensure and notify people of any deviations from this. And then within the EMS system, we also have lots of scripts and programs inbuilt either by our staff or you know with a vendor where detection of unauthorized changes are alerted, not just to the system administrators, but also to the management, right? To ensure that these changes, these unauthorized changes can be addressed. Sometimes it may be that, hey, somebody forgot to get the baseline within the timeline before the script ran or before the program ran and so on and so forth. So we have all of these um, checks and balances. And then finally, uh, we have escalation process. So in case things do not go the way it should be, then we can go back and talk to, uh, you know, the people in charge to make sure that they are following their process. Then the most important thing, which is a lot of times people forget is training, right? We want to train staff on the tools which you use. And so um, we do a lot of training. Since COVID, we also started using a lot of Kahoot. Kahoot has been a great help for us. We do quizzes, we have teams, we um, give prizes out. Which helps because there's, you know, this whenever there's a challenge between teams, people always like it and they always want to be on the podium. And uh, when you divide them into different teams, it helps even better because they want to compete. So these are some of the things which we do. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and hear from Christian next. So first off, uh, thank you for that prize one, the cahoots. I'm going to take that back to my shop because that's actually a good suggestion. Um, what I see, Jeannie, it, it, a lot of similar sentiment that Lynn alluded to, but I, I'm going to focus more on just some of the structure within our group. So 
a lot of times it's really about the buy-in from the people, you know, the folks who are doing it day in, day out. Now, what does that look like? Is it one meeting? Is it two meetings? Is it, you know, you have a conversation with them and hopefully they say yes, yay or nay. In a month from now, they forgot that they said yes or nay on that topic. So what we really try to do is really get that, like you mentioned, and I mentioned before, as a champion, someone to drive it internally within that group. And that's really helped us be a champion on these projects, but also report back on changes or adjustments. And then on top of that, it's that field experience. Uh, a lot of times some of these change managements from a standard, even from a fact 008, it's, well, what's going on a day to day? How are you actually recording this? What does that actually look like? How are these ratings get inputted? So it's it really is important for us to go out to the field and talk to the field employees and ask them, what does this look like? What's that function? What is your next step? Uh, well, we did a good job like two or three years ago to kind of start outlining a lot of these steps because a lot of times it's that such a, such a matter of expertise that's here and then it leaves and no one knows how that process was put together. It's just, um, you know, history of knowledge, but we really started to document some of those process flows that does take time, but it's critical in helping us ensure are we having the right people involved? So then when that change manager occurs, you can go back to that document and say, hey, who are the key stakeholders on this topic? Who do we need to reach out to? Who do we need to have dialogue with to emit that new solution? Um, and then once you get that going too, and you get the buy-in, the really big thing is just that constant communication. But like Lynn alluded to, to earlier as well, it's, it's that accountability. You know, what are the controls? What accountability? What's that visibility of that topic, of that process that you're changing? You know, who needs to see it? Who needs to report out to it? And do they know why it's critical? Um, sometimes you get a conversation of, hey, this is important because it's important to me, but what's the baseline? What's critical behind this? What's the information? What's the NERC stand associated with it that I can tap into as well, get the information and knowledge? Um, and then for us, the training is a big thing. Uh, you heard me earlier talk about our globally, we did a training program, and there was a book that we all required to read, which was, um, it's called the Energy Bus by John Gordon. And it really highlighted just that process of a champion, get someone on your bus. How do you keep them on the bus? And then if they get off the bus, what does that look like? And how do you close out projects? How do you close out procedures? How do you close out these controls and this change management that you're implementing with a end date in mind that you're being accountable for as well? And then, like I said, technology I mentioned about that earlier. I think COVID helped us in some way because it forced us to tap into the new avenues, new processes, new way to conduct training, new ways to look at different port uh, portfolios require people to step up in certain components, but also it opened the gauntlet of what is available to us. You know, like I said, the Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint, you know, just the power of some of these technology that's out there, the smart sheet tools. I mean, anything you can automate, people love the word, hearing the word automation. So that's one less thing they have to do, but then also it's that input as well. Um, and then that's, that's really what helped us become a success, but also implement new technology. And like I said, fact zero zero eight, we're going through some of those changes now internally as far as documentation and ensuring the right procedures. And we're adjusting it properly, but we're using our practices that we had previously to help us make those shifts associated with that. Um, and the last thing, organization, I mean, it, it's leadership is huge. If your leadership buys in, leadership supports, leadership attends the meetings. That goes a real long way as far as having successful management of a process control or procedure is getting their buy-in, but also their support. And one thing we've done a lot, probably too much in my opinion, is having sometimes executives send that email out so everybody knows it's important to them. But sometimes we see too many of that, you know, what's really a priority, but that should also help us get more visibility on certain controls and processes as well. But those are some things that kind of helped us be successful and so we're still working on too from a change management, the fact 008. All right, thank you so much. And then last, we will hear from Stephanie. Thanks. So um, a, a lot of the same, so I won't repeat um, where I can remember because it's been a lot of information. But what I will add is, especially to what Christian said here, is helping the um, end users understand why they're doing what they're doing and why they need to be uh, why they need to care about it, right? If they are, if you, if they're handed a process that says do these ten steps, they can certainly do those. Um, but unless they understand the why um, and really feel part of that, then that's going to open room for human performance issues. Um, and we all use a variety of technology and tools. Uh, we use Sigma Flow. We have a pretty robust SIP 10 change management workflow in Sigma Flow that's on its fourth iteration because we just keep trying to make it better and better. Um, but that doesn't mean that the users still shouldn't understand why they're doing it. At the end of the day, technology sh it should support compliance, but it typically doesn't replace it. There's always still going to be a human on the other end using that technology. 
So we need to help them understand that. We also try, um, one other thing I'll kind of highlight is with the technology and the tools and the processes, whatever it is, because not everyone's gonna have technology or a special tool. So whatever you do have, um, you know, take the guesswork out where you can, right? If you can help the end users find the roadmap to be on and take the right paths, you're gonna be more successful. And for us, that's been, I think, a big win where we have, and we didn't always know what those um, kind of gaps or forks in the road were gonna be, but we listened to our business areas where they struggled, we asked them for feedback, we, we take that feedback and then we try to make their lives better. Um, so where they struggle, where they don't understand, help with job aids, work instructions, processes, whatever it is, it, whether it's in a technology or in a tool or whether it's just written down on a piece of paper, um, help them to know which direction to take. Um, and you know that I think helps them be successful, which in turn helps us be successful. I just want to add one more thing based on what Stephanie just mentioned, right? I forgot to mention that in addition, we also have what is called as potential impact notification, which is a document which is attached to the outage management ITOA ticket, which lists what the changes high level, right? Why the changes made, when the changes going to be made, who are your liaisons, what the escalation is processes, and also lists, you know, the tests we conducted to make sure that this change will not or will have minimal impact to production. And uh, one more thing for um, Tom and my sub cybersecurity team there, the information we put in Kahoot does not have BCSI and it's not in the cloud. All right, thank you so much. Any last comments from the panelists? Anything else you want to cover before we go to questions? Yes. Last thing I just want to cover is one thing that really helped us in the success of this change is just be open minded. I think it's it's hard. We all have a lot of work on our plate, we all have a lot of responsibility, a lot of tasks. But I think the one message that I've kind of heard from them and others is you're in this room too, just be open minded. Be open to hearing the insight, hearing the input, because once you start talking to individuals, you may turn it or you may be more innovative in one area than another. You may change, go a different route. So just if you leave with anything, be open minded, try and change your culture as best you can. And it kind of starts with you to kind of start that process. All right. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear from you all. Does anyone in the audience have any burning questions or any moderate questions? Yes. Um, could you come up to the microphone so everyone can hear you? The question was, can you reference the book that Christian talked right. about? Energy bus. Bus, yeah, school bus by uh, John Gordon. Gordon. Yes. Thank you very much. That was fantastic information. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the panel a question. Um, I, I just want to say it's my amazing idea. Good. Yeah, I will think about it. I think it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing idea. Oh uh, yeah, of course the BCSI need to be taken care of. Um, I want to like say first a comment about uh, being at a, at a level first of all uh, to be able to have that kind of quizzes. Uh, in an organization, so the culture is already established, so that people actually are participating, you know, in that actively. So that's a, that's kind of itself uh, is admirable uh, in the sense that we have, you know, as an organization, uh, you, you've reached there and people are taking interest. So culturally, it's kind of is there. A general idea, which you know, in some of the other conferences I had, and I wanted to make a comment on that, and Beck is here as well, is that uh, like you know, IT is a kind of a um, Compliance, uh, a, a kind of a benchmark for reaching maturity, like the C2M2 and other methods. Maybe it's something that we can have compliance side also, maybe it's too early, but uh, as a benchmark to determine that where we are as an organization, perhaps maybe uh, in the future, if not now, uh, from, from a maturity level, that if this organization needs more work, it's less of work, and maybe it doesn't need to be that complicated. Maybe one, two, three, four. That's maybe just a side comment. I mean, the question for you guys is that, like, like uh, especially uh, from LinkedIn, that uh, the organization is doing a hard work on on maintaining from 
a SIP 10 1.5 perspective, identical uh, simulation environments and test systems. Uh, again, admiration, that's a very tough job. I, I know that because I've been in that, in that uh, framework, how to, how to do that. It's a lot of work to maintain that. But thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned about the tools. Uh, I wanted to know from San Diego also the tools you're using, and maybe if I missed that. Uh, and I also, also wanted to ask you uh, in, in general, like what are your what are your what are your, if you have any of those, what are your key challenges in, in implementing those, those change management cultures? Like what are your major roadblocks and, and then how do you work from them? Please. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and start with tools and then we'll move to Roadbox. Yeah, so so tools kind of similar. Power base, Sigma Flow, from an asset standpoint, we use uh, Cascade. Um then the SharePoint as well. So some of the typical ones you're hearing is something we use in our aspect. Um, and then a question on, you know, from the culture, I think it was people, if they don't agree with it or if there's difficulties, what you're looking for? Was it just, re what challenges have you run into trying to implement a change management okay. culture? Challenges. Yeah, exactly. What kind of feedbacks you had, like, yeah. you went through that, you know, um, uh, process of improving the culture. Yeah. So they, they're like, oh, I have to handle this and, you know, tackle this and maybe put some, uh, you know, extra yeah. effort here. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it goes to kind of what, you was for, what I mentioned before is we all have our day job. So sometimes it's change management is in addition to everything else you're doing, every other responsibility. I'm in exactly. operations, you know, so certain things happen. I can't attend a meeting because I have to go to the field to help support an issue that we have. So I think what really what helped us in kind of some of the roadblocks was really understanding the importance of the change management, which came from the leadership, the executives saying, hey, I want you to present to me on this topic. In the next amount of days, you're going to present to us. So make sure you have your ducks in a row. Um, and then the other aspect is kind of that visibility, you know, that, that recognition, you know, whether it's a certain type of funding recognition, recognition it's a lunch meeting with the, something of that side to show the, the importance of what we're doing and how it's important for the executive. So that was some of the initial roadblocks to say, is this really a priority? Is this just a nice to have or is this something we need to do? And then uh, from, a, from a more of a, a compliance standpoint, we see a lot of roadblocks is the why. You know, why am I doing this additional? What's the important of this? I doesn't make any sense. There's no benefit. But kind of what Steph alluded to, once we laid out the process, laid out the reasoning, laid out the standards, laid out, if you, if you don't do it, here's the fine that comes with it, that usually gets their ears kind of perked a little bit and more interested. Good That's question. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Do either of you two want to answer the Roadbox question? So, so uh, yeah, uh, first of all, Tariq, um, there's a written rule in the back of your slide which says you have only five questions, so we have only two more questions. Sure. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm using all my lifeline today. So, uh, do I have? Yeah, yeah, so I think for the but, but seriously, thank you for asking all the questions on our behalf. Right? <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. 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 And so, um, I waited. I waited for others to come up. I'm like, okay, this is a silence period. So let me just fill in. All right. So give all the lifelines to Tariq. So okay, next. So uh, yeah. So um, change management is a difficult process, right? I mean, it is a people based how should I call it, uh, it has to be com coming from with the people. You may have tools, you may have technology, but if the people are not involved, it can happen. Right? And that's why the leadership, the you know, individual managers make a lot of difference. As an example, right, the, I talked about the change, potential impact notification. I create the document. So this shows to my staff that this is an important process. I get input from them, make sure that the changes with the listed are okay and I send out the email. So this makes them feel that, yes, this is important for us. And uh, the change management procedure, which we have created for the EMS, it is by the staff. They take ownership of what they're going to do, how they're going to do. They list these other high, medium, low risks. So they assess it and they review it and they do that, right? And we also involve the stakeholders in the change management process, not only for approvals, for information, but also to create the email change management process. They came in and helped us. And then I finally mentioned that we ask our end users to come in and test it on our QA system. So that helps them, they feel that the change which is going to go in, I was involved in the testing. So it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time, but with uh, keeping on pushing, you will go over the rock. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. I'll, I'll be cautious to use my life funds because I think one and a half more days to go. You know, I don't want to use a lot, right? Thank you for the answers. I appreciate it. Very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Or next, please. Do we have time for one more? <laughs> we have time for at least one more. Okay. Um, Two more. We'll get we'll get them both. 
I'm hearing um, a little bit of a trend uh, or theme about Sigma Flow. So getting pretty uh, curious about that tool. If it's um, like a GRC type of tool, or is it like a, you know a, a ticketing change management type of, type of tool, or all of the above? Also curious to see if it actually creates a CMDB, a change management uh, database, or um, configuration management database. Um, and wondering if I know I'm using like three questions here. <laughs> So thank you for giving me a you know a little bit of liberty with that. But also curious to see how you guys are addressing like the human error types of uh, issues with change management because a lot of it can't be automated, can't be preventative. You know, so how do you make sure that changes aren't done prior to them being approved, prior to them being fully tested? You know, since a lot of it is you know policy driven or procedure driven. You know, how are you addressing human error um, types of issues? Sure, I, I can jump on that if you want. So um, if you stick around for WICF, I'm going to do a Sigma Flow um, overview in the software panel. So I'm not going to go deep dive right now. But what I will tell you is it's kind of a little bit of everything. It does have GRC capabilities to track. Uh, we use it for tracking all of our compliance um, for uh, our saws and self-cert, but we also use it for change management. Our, like I said, we have a pretty robust workflow in there. Um, and then it does um, tie to SIP 10, to the standard, to the RSA. It retains the evidence and it holds the all the change ticket information, if you will. So um, and I'll dive more into that um, later in the week. But um, for human performance error, what I'll say is when we build those workflows, we try to consider where that can happen, right? Where is something that a user is going to have to do something from a manual uh, perspective? And in those cases, we build in where we can. We build in peer checks. We build in auto, uh, reports that they can refer to, right? So maybe do your work, take, uh, you complete this task, and then click this button to open this report and check your work, if you will, right? Um, kind of a, a balance there of um, where it can be checked versus when it can't. And then it also will go through a set of approvals as well. So numerous eyes, right, on those things that are kind of high risk um, human performance gaps, if you will, is how we tend to do that. If and when we do have human performance error, we do also then circle back and work with those business areas to do cause analysis, um, retraining, corrective actions, whatever it needs to be, right? We're soft on the people, hard on the process is kind of our our take on that, right? Where um, people are going to be people and we're going to have uh, errors. And so what can we do to strengthen the process, whether it's automated or manual, how can we make it better to help them not fall into an error trap? I love that. I haven't heard that before. Soft on the people, hard in the process. That's, that's a nice little logo. Anyone else? I, I can, you know, Sigma Force, she's going to handle it, but uh, the event, we do event analysis and lessons learned. And I also mentioned that we do periodic review of our change management processes. And so that helps us in improving. It's not going to be always smooth. You will fail, but you learn from it and you correct it and you move forward. Thank you. And a shout out for the GRC presentation that's coming up on the Wicked Day. <laughs> All right, and we'll go ahead and hear our last question. Hi, this is Pat Lynch from NRG. Thank you for your perspective on change management. I'm going to echo something similar to what the last question was about. It's uh, more a concern, you know, like on the SIP side, you could, there's a lot of automated systems and it's very kind of structured for approvals and using a process flow. But on the ops and planning side of the house, it's human driven and that's where your downfall is. Um, what would you suggest as far as recommendations for reminding people a trigger point or a reminder ahead of the change management to ensure that you don't have to wait until you have to catch it in the controls review? That's the question I have. So I'll, I'll take this one to start. Um, so I think something that we've done in that space is I kind of mentioned before is that accountability or is it a lot more eyes, but it's weekly emails on the triggers, on the actions coming up, on the maintenance items, on, hey, this firm needs to be finished. So we, we create a weekly report that goes out and we require individuals to respond with, hey, what's the status? 
So they have that week to respond as far as updates. So that kind of gives that more visibility, whether it's, it's, hey, this is happening next week. It's 30 days, 15 days, 180 days. So we see where's that timeline. That's kind of helped us from the accountability piece, but also the requirement people know there's more visibility on the topic. Um, the other thing we've done as well is we've kind of more of internal audits, probably before WET gets on site, but we do more of internal audits. We actually go to the field and investigate and verify and validate that that occurred. It's like, it's like she mentioned, humans going to make an error. That's just right. part of, especially in operations, nobody's perfect. No matter what kind of training, what type of practice, what type of history they have with the company, there's going to make some type of mistake. So how do you have additional eyesight on it? In operational world, we really try to have more internal audits going out to the field, looking at certain processes and procedures. And they, there's this update, as they said it did. Even though they had a documentation, the documentation is not matching what's in that system. What was the reason why? So we try to include that as well. Um, and then another thing we do as well is we have a, a bi-weekly kind of all hands where we talk about all the stuff that is supposed to come up. So it's a larger audience, but it's, once again, increased visibility, increased the ownership that accountability so people have more awareness that this is important and then you have the leader ask a question hey why has that been done yet why is it not scheduled so it's just pushes more of that in part on them um i would say we're not perfect by any means but i think having that additional oversight and ask those challenging questions in a larger meeting shows others hey this is a priority for me i need to answer by next week on this topic yeah i think the only thing other, other thing i can add is just like um you know she mentioned accountability, right? We have what is called as requirement owners, right? Especially for it helps in a lot of the ONP standards because there are less automation of tools, right? However, you can still build tools, whether it's Excel based or SharePoint based or Sigma Flow or whatever else you have, right? And I think I mentioned before we have dedicated um, champions for change management. You can also have dedicated champions for various standards. And our compliance department, which is the library compliance and coordination, they do a great job of coordination, right? They let us know ahead of time, hey, ERC 005 with dates coming or BAL 00, whatever, right? Uh, SIP 13, SIP 12, SIP. They, they inform us ahead of time that these are due dates. And so the primary requirement owners and the delegates then can take action. And then if not, you do the escalation. Thank you. All right. So let's go ahead and give a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much.